Hi, I'm Magnus Walker and welcome to my downtown LA garage. I'm a man with a beard and I'm a Porsche collector and enthusiast. And today I'm going to show you around my collection of what I call Porsche cars. So let's go take a tour. I suppose I'm known for basically customizing cars, but half of my collection is somewhat bone stock, if not slightly modified. When it comes to Porsche, I'm a goal-orientated collector, and I'm all about everything from front engine, mid engine, rear engine, both air and water cooled. My story goes back to 1977 when I first wrote a letter to Porsche at the age of 10 years old, when my dad took me to the London Olds Court Motor Show in 1977. I came back with all the brochures, I had a poster on the wall, and believe it or not, I wrote a letter to Porsche saying, hey, I want to design cars for you. 35 years later, after my Urban Outlaw film came out, they actually wrote me a letter back and invited me to tour the museum. That was back in 2013. So what we have here is basically the 911 part of my collection. My collection includes 924s, 928s, 944s, 968s, and a couple of 914s plus some air and water-cooled Porsches. I bought my first Porsche back in 1992 at the age of 25 years old. To me, that represented a dream come true and a sense of personal achievement. Over the past 28 years, I've owned quite a few more. The second Porsche I ever bought is my most favorite car. It's the car I'm most associated with, and it's the car over here, car number 277. This started life as a 1971 911T. That is the second Porsche I ever bought, and I also bought that at the Pomona Swap Meet back in 1991. So I've owned that car for 21 years. It's the one that's featured in the majority of my videos, and it's the car that I call my favorite pair of old jeans or my favorite pair of old comfortable shoes. I just feel comfortable in it. It's gone through a few motors. It's currently on a 2.8 uh, liter twin plug short stroke motor, which is a little bit of a Frankenstein motor, uh, which punches out quite a lot of horsepower, but it's a streetable car. It's not a full blown track car. It's got what I call a lot of smiles per mile. So maybe what we should do is take a little beat here, open the front gate, and I'll show you a little further around the car. So the car was built as a streetable track car that was developed over time. In 2002, I joined the Porsche Owners Club and took my street driving to the track. And over the next six years, did a lot of track days ranging everywhere from Willow Springs to Laguna Seca, Thunder Hill, California Speedway, Phoenix Motor Speedway, Las Vegas Motor Speedway, to name a few. But one of the coolest things about 277, I could talk for an hour about that, but we've got to cram a lot of cars into a short period of time. So the goal here is not to take a deep dive into every car, but just sort of highlight the cars in the collection. But the coolest thing for me about 277, if you walk this way, is it has its very own Hot Wheels. And not just one Hot Wheels, but that was the first one. That was the second one. That's the third one. That's the fourth one. That's the fifth one. And that's the sixth one. The most recent one though is the Slant Nose 911 version of 277 that you see right here. So. About five years ago, I formed a relationship with Hot Wheels. He said, would you be interested in designing cars with us? And five years later and 25 cars later, I have my own little Hot Wheels. One of them is my good luck charm that's gone all around the world with me. It's kind of like my little rabbit's foot that's always with me. So we all have a Hot Wheels story. There's my Hot Wheels story on car number 277. But if you follow me through, we'll talk a little bit more about a few of the other cars in the collection. Those are little rolling Hot Wheels right there. So as I said earlier, I fell in love with Porsche as a 10 year old back in 1977. So you guys can probably do the math and realize I'm 53 years old. The car that started my love affair with Porsche though was a white martini 1977 Turbo. I had the poster on the wall, which is what you can see behind you. And eventually I got that era of car, but I didn't just get one. I ended up with at one time seven three liter 930 turbos. I'm now down to five. These two are 1975, these two are 1976. 
and the ice cream metallic one at the end of the line is a 1977 version. I always say no two cars drive the same, no two cars are alike, and to me, I'm all about variety. If I want to step back in time 45 years and feel what a turbo might have been like in 1975, here's a right-hand drive example. 1975 was the first year of the 930 Turbo. And believe it or not, Porsche made 284 of these 930 Turbos, which became the iconic symbol of all things Porsche to many, many people. When you think about Porsche, you do think about the turbo, the wide flares, the big arches, the big whale tail. Just looks fast standing still. Of those 284 cars that Porsche made in 1975, they only made 32 that were right-hand drive. This is a right-hand drive example of one of two made in this exotic color of copper brown metallic. So if you'd said to me a few years ago I'd be buying a 75 right-hand drive turbo from Australia, I would say you're crazy. But that's what I did. The car was God's red when I found it somewhere close to Sydney, Australia. My buddies at Auto House Hamilton checked out the car and then I shipped it back to LA, I think in like 2013, 2014. My buddy Matt Bound painted it back to the original color in my chop shop across the road. And that original color is copper brown metallic. So ironically, this is the first right-hand drive car I have ever owned. You guys are probably thinking, well, he's English, right? Well, yes, I am, but I never owned a car in England. So my very first right-hand drive car happens to be a pretty rare, only 32 made, one of two in that color, 1975 930 Turbo. Ironically, sat right next to it, it's a left-hand drive 75 930 Turbo. This is one of my favorites. This is a very long-winded story that I do not have time to share with you right now, but we'll check back later and we'll do a deep dive on the left-hand drive 75 Turbo, which, long story short, came to me as a complete car minus uh, drivetrain, no engine and transmission. Long, long story short, I accidentally found the original motor. So now it's a numbers matching car. These cars are all numbers matching early three liter turbos in original colors, not necessarily original paint. But I couldn't leave them alone. I had to modify them a little bit. These were subtle modifications of being lowered and on wider wheel and tire packages just to give it that meaty stance. Ironically though, when you look at turbos from this area, they probably ran a seven and eight inch wheel with a 195 and a 215 tire. But in this day and age, we like them on eight, nines and tens with something like a 225, 275 tire combo to fill out those rear arches and make them look super racy. We should take a beat though for a moment and talk about the first turbo that I bought was this 1976 US spec 930 Turbo Carrera. Ironically, this turned out to be the first US production turbo ever sold. And I actually had that verified by the guys at the archive department in the museum based on the VIN number. There were four cars made before this one. This is the VIN number 15. Porsche likes to start their VIN numbers at 11. 11 through 14 were press dealer demo cars. 15 was the first one actually sold to a private customer. So that is the first US production turbo ever sold. It's a lifelong LA car. I'm the fourth owner. The car was delivered in 1976 to Bob Smith Porsche in Hollywood. My buddy Marty Materian of Vons Diesel and Team VDS out there in the valley, if you want to check him out, turned me on to this car. He'd worked on it for the past probably 25 years for the prior two owners. So I'm the fourth owner. It is one of my favorites. And there's just something really special about driving an early three liter four speed turbo. These cars don't necessarily have a ton of power by today's standards. They're notorious for having massive turbo lag. Tall gear ratios, I'll break it down for you. First gear is good for 45 miles an hour. Second gear is good for about 90. Third's good for about 115, 120. And fourth will do the rest. So you better make sure that you're in the right gear ratio at the right time for when that boost comes on. Because you're either going really fast or if you're in second gear making a right hand turn at 20 miles an hour, you're bogged down going really, really slow. The other thing you have to remember with these cars is small brakes, two piston caliper, non-power assisted. So that means they don't really stop great either. Even if you've got them shot on some really sticky Hoosier R6 rubber matched to some eight and nine inch Fuchs. 
But if you can this way, we'll talk a little bit about why the US spec car is a Turbo Carrera and the rest of the world are just simply badged as turbos. So we talked about the 75 turbos behind me, rest of the world. The US didn't get a turbo until 1976. Something to do with emissions and gas guzzling taxes. But Porsche has probably sold more turbos in the US 45 years later than any other country in the world. And LA, California is probably Porsche's number one market. So why did they call it a Turbo Carrera? Well, the US never got the iconic 1973 Carrera RS. The folks in Porsche's marketing department decided, hey, let's add a Carrera badge to the US production cars and call them a Turbo Carrera. It'll probably sell great. Remember though, this is a proper turbo, not like those Taycans that are badge turbos that don't have turbos in them. But that's a whole different story. We'll talk about that next time. But if you want to come and see the back, we'll show you the difference in badging. And we can talk a little bit about the difference in Euro or rest of the world spec to US spec. When it comes to output and horsepower, US turbo 240 horsepower, Euro rest of the world cars 260 horsepower. Difference really is cam timing and cam profile. A good way to tell the difference visually though, if you don't have the Turbo Carrera tail, is the bumperettes. These are US spec bumperettes. These are rest of the world bumperettes. Obviously you guys know these are interchangeable. One of the greatest things about Porsches, at least for the first 30 years, is the interchangeability of all components. Meaning if you happen to have like a 64 911 that originally had a two liter motor with 130 horsepower, if you wanted to, you could put this three liter, 260 horsepower Euro turbo motor in it and instantly double the horsepower for your car and chassis. It literally bolts into the same bolts. Obviously you've got to up update the suspension, probably want to go to a different transmission and all that. But we'll talk about that when we talk about modifying Porsches. Remember these turbos, are essentially stock other than being lowered. This one's a Euro 76 Swiss delivery. And then this one is actually one of my favorites, even though I don't really drive it that much. Everything that I say I normally don't care about with Porsches, books, records, history, uh, you know, paperwork, the rubber gloves that came with it, the toolkit, low mileage, all those things that I don't really care about. This car actually has them. It's a 76 US spec turbo Carrera, in ice cream metallic with when you get a chance to check it out inside this awesome olive green leather interior with a black watch hound's tooth plaid center seat section so that basically covers the row of three liter euro and us turbos these are the early cars what came later in 78 was the 3.3 liter turbo with a different tail intercooler and bigger brakes. That car ran all the way through 1989 when it was replaced by the 964. But we'll take a little walk around. We've done the middle row. Let's talk a little bit about air-cooled early 911s because for me, I'm a goal-orientated collector. My goal originally, I've talked about it a lot, was to acquire one of every Porsche from the original birth year, 1964, all the way through 1973. That covered short wheelbase and long wheelbase early 911s that are known as long hood cars compared to what came later, short hood cars. These came out in 1974 really as a crash bumper impact type of safety, road and safety uh, device. But let's talk about one of my favorite cars, my very early 1965, which is right here in the corner. That's what I was saying earlier, the iconic 911 was born in 1964. Porsche made 232 examples of what was known as the 64 911. Some will say the 901, but it was never badged that way. The, the bean counters will say Porsche made 82 cars that were tagged as 901s, but to most people, they're just 64 911s. This one's a 65 911, it's car number 310. So it was basically assembled in 64, finished in 65. This car I've owned for, I don't know, almost a dozen years. It's what I call if Paul Smith had an early 911, this would be the gentleman's race car as opposed to some of these more boy racer graphics. Now, what makes an early short wheelbase car for me really fun and a must have for every Porsche enthusiast is these cars are super nimble. 
you know, super easy to drive. I mean, they move around, they're alive, they're energized. You know, 100 miles an hour in this feels like you're doing, you know, 150 in reality. It's like the, the perception of speed is strange. You're not going as fast as you think you are, but all your senses are tingling. You know, it looks good, sounds good, smells good, feels good, and tastes good. And all of that is in 130 horsepower motor on a six inch wheel on a 15 inch rim. The early cars have these iconic four screw horn grills right here if you want to zoom in on this. Originally these were brass plated and then chrome plated over the top of it. So it was brass chrome plate. These were stripped back to reveal the chrome. The car was originally silver and then I added what I call this gentleman's race car livery. So for me, I like what I call these sport purpose, streetable early 911s. It's what I refer to the glory years of Porsche Motorsports. It's the Vic Elford uh, anniversary year. It's 1965 through 1973, leading all the way up to Porsche's first outright Le Mans victory in 1970 in the 917, but we'll get back to that later. What stood next to it? Irish Green 1966. This to me is like if I want to step from the boy racer sport purpose into pretty much bone stock, two liter, 130 horsepower, 901 transmission, 1966 Irish Green. This is like stepping back in time. I acquired this car quite a few years ago up in Seattle. I flew up there, took a rainy test drive around Seattle and acquired the car and it's one of my favorites. It's not the original paint, but it's the original color. If you come around and look inside, it's got this great patina, worn out carpets, thick rid, uh, rimmed wood steering wheel, and somewhat of a antiquated rifle bolt style shift pattern on the 901 transmission. For those that know what it is, dog leg first down and then H pattern second through fifth. So to me, this covers sport purpose, and it covers pretty much bone stock, early, short wheel base, 65, 66, 911. So if you guys haven't driven one, certainly get a chance. It's kind of like a Beetle on steroids, so fun cars to drive. Next to it, 1974, 911, wide-bodied slant nose conversion. Remember at the beginning of this tour, I told you about, you know, the very first Porsche I ever bought. It was a 1974, 911 slant nose. Ironically, I'd been chasing a slant nose a couple of years ago, looking at everything from factory code slant nose to custom conversions to DP Kramer, Koningsegg, and uh, uh, Gumballa and DP conversions. I traveled all over the country and never found what I was looking for. Ironically, this found me less than 20 miles from where we're standing in little old town Pasadena. Ironically, when I checked the VIN number, it turned out to be a 1974 US Carrera underneath this sort of Moby Dick 935 style fiberglass kit body that was put on sometime in the 80s or 90s. I have no paperwork on the car. It's running a 2.7 liter RS MFI spec motor built on a 1973 E case. So essentially it's all show, no go. Looks fast, but doesn't really go fast. What it really needs is some sort of five, 600 horsepower twin turbo motor. So for right now, it's just a fun car that I occasionally drive that is on the project list when I find the time, and more importantly, the motivation to go big, stay boosted and build a big horsepower motor to do that wide body kit all the justice that it deserves. Next to it though, if we walk down the line in non-chronological order, is one of my favorites. This started life as a 1978 SC. 1978 was the first year of the three liter car for the US market. In Europe, they had the 76, 77 three liter MFI Carrera, but for the US market, it's a three liter CIS motor. It's what known as short hood as opposed to long hood over there. The bumpers come further up. So what I built here was another streetable track car based loosely on what I would call a baby narrow bodied IROC car. IROC bumpers, but still on narrow fenders. Lowered slightly running a 16 um, by seven and eight inch Fuchs with some 225, 245 tires. It's got this very cool punk rock tartan interior. It's got some plexi quarter window panels and it's got an early ducktail giving it an aggressive look. 
These are the type of cars that are really, really fun in the canyons. They've got a little bit more bottom mid-range than the early short wheelbase two-liter cars, because the three-liter is a pretty torquey, bulletproof motor. Approximately 180 horsepower, but in a car that weighs, I don't know, 22, 2300 pounds, that's more than enough. I'm actually one of those guys that when it comes to horsepower, less is more, more about momentum, carrying speed, and uh, having fun along the way. So that's the 78 SCHR, SCHR for hot rod. Next to it though, ironically, is perhaps one of the rarest cars that I own. And every Porsche enthusiast that comes through here, I always ask them, hey, what do you think this car is? And nine out of 10 times, nobody ever gets it right because it looks very similar to the car that's next to it, the SC. So I won't play the guessing game like I do with all the visitors that come by. I'll just cut to the chase and tell you what it is. It's Porsche's last production MFI car. Now, what does that mean? What it means is it's one of 113 built in 1976 at the end of the three liter production run. Somehow Porsche must have had some leftover 2.7 liter RS MFI motors. You know, those have got the number 911-83. Yeah, those same motors that are found in the iconic 1973 RS Carrera, the same motor that's in the 74 and 75. But what makes this special then if it's the same motor? Well, Porsche only made 113 of them. It's the last production MFI car, factory sunroof delete, factory manual windows, and factory limited slip. And remember, they only made 113 of them. That's like 10% of the 1,580, less than, of the iconic 73 RS. And it pretty much drives the exact same way. This one's the 13th one built. It's the oldest one documented that I've seen surviving. I didn't know it existed when I acquired it about 10 years ago. Ironically, it's a really cool story. All these Porsches have cool stories. This one came from an ad I was running everywhere. 64 911 wanted. I get a text from some guy who says, hey, I know this is not what you're looking for, but my brother's got a 76 911, are you interested? I said, sure, I'll look at anything. He sends me like five crappy iPhone photos, the car's in a garage, flat tires, bunch of boxes on top of it, bike leaned against it. I don't think too much of it. I scroll through the photos on my smartphone and I see the last one. I'm thinking this should be a CSI car, 2.7 liter. But hey, this is an MFI motor. But like I said earlier, everything's interchangeable. But I got a little bit more excited. I asked him for the VIN number. He gives me the VIN number, 911-669023, or something like that. I pull out the iconic Porsche Red Book, flick through, try to find the VIN number. VIN number doesn't exist. I happen to go on the world's greatest Porsche forum, Pelican Parts, and I see a thread talking about the 1976 unknown Carrera. Turns out this was one of those very rare cars with all the details that I just told you. So that was how I acquired perhaps the rarest car I own, the 1976 2.7 liter MFI Carrera. You're probably thinking, well, he's got a right-hand drive turbo that they only made 32 of over there, but he made 284 cars in 75. This one was 113, but they're both pretty special. And obviously no two cars drive the same. So that is me talking about air-cooled 911s. But obviously we know for the past 21 years, Porsche has been running this thing that they call Wasserke cooled. Wasserke cooled, what is this? That means simply in German, water cooled. Porsche had reached the point of performance wise where due to cooling and horsepower and various other restraints, they needed to go to water cooled engines to make more power reliability. So in 1999, much to the dismay of all the early 911 air-cooled purists, Porsche took the iconic 911 and made it water-cooled. So let's go take a look at an early water-cooled 911. So the 1999 Gen 1 US spec aero kit, red, 3.4 liter. All the purists instantly bitched about the headlights, the fried head headlights. You know, and they'd slam the car based on the look of the headlights. I always say, you know what? You don't see them when you're driving the car. And I think these cars have aged really, really well. The prior model was the last of the air called the 993 parked next to it. So it's kind of good for reference point. And we'll get into this car in a minute. But I acquired this car about a year ago. It wasn't my first water-cooled car. Uh, the GT3 actually was, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But what I really like about this car is it's kind of raw. It's got enough power to actually be fun. 
it's super nimble and it's aged really, really well. It doesn't seem huge like the new 991 and 992 does, and it still feels analog. So Gen 1, 1999, 996, Porsche's first water-cooled car. One of my favorites and the first water-cooled 911 I bought is the car next to it. So we should hop over here and talk about the 2004 GT3. This to me is one of my favorite driving experiences. I acquired this car back in 2016. It's a Gen 2 996. The purists will notice the difference between the Gen 1 headlights and the Gen 2 headlights. Obviously, I couldn't leave this car alone. I had to add my own Brumos inspired custom paint, and this is paint, it's not a wrap. It's rolling on the uh, updated uh, black powder coated wheels, and it's on some sticky Pirelli Trofeo R rubber. But what I like about the GT3 in this form, Gen 2 996, Super chiseled, it reminds me of 277 on steroids. Great throttle response, great turning, great mechanical grip, all in a narrow bodied format, devoid of big wings and add-ons. To me, it's the purest form of the GT3. And remember the GT3 came out with the 996. So this is US spec. Perhaps the only car that is better is the GT3 RS, sadly a car that's out of my price point, but of all the RSs that I've driven, the GT3 RS 996 variety is one of my favorites. The last of the water-cooled cars in here though, we should jump over and take a look at. If Darth Vader drove a water-cooled 996, it would probably be this, 2002 GT2. To many, almost 20 years ago, this was the king of the hill, turbocharged two-wheel drive. Remember, 996 Turbo, in a way a similar car, but it's a four-wheel drive car. This is still pretty analog, two-wheel drive, six-speed manual. It's what I call the executive hooligan car. But it's also a car that you can drive all day long to San Francisco if you like, and get out not feeling beat up or buzzed. Great Canyon car, but really a practical, relatively easy car to drive below 3000 RPM. Above 3000 RPM, different story. So for me, I've got the GT2 and the GT3, turbocharged versus normally aspirated. The GT3 revs a little higher, possibly seems a little more throttle responsive. This car though, I'm not gonna call it a wolf in sheep's clothing, but you know, you better sort of be on your game when you want to go pedal to the metal in the 996 2002 black on tan gt2 ironically in a way it's a little bit like the 76 turbo the first us turbo ever sold for me in the sense of it was a car that found me this is also a lifelong la car i'm believe it or not the third owner at first i wasn't in love with this butterscotch interior but it's leather on leather on leather and i mean Leather on leather on leather. The headliner's leather, the CD's leather, the heat events are leather, but it still drives like a brute. And for me, this was a real find because I'd been looking for a GT2 for quite some time. A couple of my buddies had them and they all fell into the same category. No one really drove them. Like 20,000 miles on a GT2, everyone thought was a lot of miles and they weren't driving them. And it reflected in the price. What I loved about this car is it had 90,000 miles. It had been driven. I knew the prior owner, he'd spent over 50 grand on receipts on it of just maintenance. But these were highway miles. And I gotta be honest with you, it made the price probably 50% of the 20, 25,000 mile GT2s, but it drove just as good. It might even have driven better because this car was daily driven. It didn't sit, it wasn't a garage queen. It wasn't a car that someone pulled out, you know, once a month to go drive to, to the golf club or whatever it was. It was a daily driver. And that's what I love about Porsches. These things are built to be driven. My 2002 GT2 is still getting driven.